Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Before we begin, we would like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. You can expand each widget by clicking on the maximize icon at the top right of the widget or by dragging in the bottom right corner of the widget panel. Additional resources, including a copy of today's slide deck, are available in the resource list widget, indicated by a green file icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget or the group chat widget at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. You can submit questions throughout the webinar. We will also have a call-in session throughout the webinar, so you can dial in if you like. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. You can also submit technical issues via the Q&A widget. Please note, most technical issues can be resolved by pressing F5 or Command-R on Mac to refresh your player console. Finally, an on-demand version of this webcast will be available one day after the webcast using the same audience link sent to you today. Now I'd like to introduce Candice Talkington. Candice, you now have the floor. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the COVID-19 Health Data Users Group. Our topic today is using and sharing COVID-19 data. My name is Candace Talkington, and I'm going to be your facilitator. We're very excited to have three representatives today um, who are willing to share their experience using and sharing COVID-related data. Representing today are the Wisconsin Health Information Organization. We have a representative also from Mathematica and from the Florida Center for Health Information and Transparency. Representing the National Association of Health Data Organizations is Norm Thurston and Charles Hawley. Norm, I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit more about the user group before we introduce our first presenter for today. Norm? Yeah, thank you, Candice. It's good to be with you all here today uh, as part of the National Association of Health Data Organizations effort to provide services that benefit our members. We are partnering with Mathematica to sponsor the COVID-19 Healthcare Data Users Group. This webinar is the first of what we hope will be many opportunities for our user group members to interact and provide each other with useful information, uh, especially as we're dealing with this new use of data going forward. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Norm. Our first presenters today are from the Wisconsin Health Information Organization. We have Dana Richardson and Jim Arns. Dana and Jim? Thank you very much, Candace, and thank you to NATO for giving us the opportunity and for all of you to give us the opportunity to talk about a couple of projects that we have been working on as it relates to COVID-19. I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of background about the Wisconsin Health Information Organization, which is also often referred to as WIO. Our mission is really to improve quality, safety and cost efficiency of healthcare in Wisconsin. I think that's very similar to a lot of other all-payer claims databases. Uh, we are statewide, although we are a voluntary data submission state, which makes us a little bit different than many of the other APCDs out there. Today, we have about 73% of Wisconsin lives in our database, and those come from Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, commercial insurance, including some self-funded employers who submit data, and we'll be adding Medicare fee-for-service uh, later this year. Um, in 2018-2019, we moved to a new data vendor partner, Symphony Care, and since July of 2019, we've been up and running on our new system. I think one of the things that we've recognized that, that we were hopeful for, but um, definitely now know, is that we have more flexibility in our data system to meet unique needs like COVID-19 than we have had in the past. So I'm going to talk just very high level about two projects, really about why they are important, and then I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jim Aron, who is really our technical uh, expert on these projects. But there's two projects that I wanted to focus on today. One is the high-risk member reports. So about a month or so ago, uh, we received a request from our Medicaid program, and they asked if we could identify high-risk Medicaid members 
that then we would be able to provide that identifiable data back to Medicaid and say, here are the members that are of high risk in your population. So the purpose of, uh, for Medicaid was that they wanted to be able to reach out to their high risk members both by email, so they, I'm sorry, by, by a letter. So they did a blanket letter to all of their high risk members but then they've also stratified based on subpopulations, those that are of greatest risk, and they've been making phone calls to those individuals. So in the end, they really wanted the Medicaid members to understand that they're there to support them, um, both in giving them advice and information about how to protect themselves, but what to do in the event that they, they or a family member would uh, contract COVID-19, and then all sorts of other types of support services that the state is offering, like, um, you know, to address things like food insecurity. Once we developed this report for Medicaid, we turned around and offered that same opportunity to each one of our data contributors. And of the I guess about 13 data contributors that we have, six additional health plans said, boy, this would be great. We'd be happy to reach out to our members and make sure that they know that, um, that we're here for them. So out of our population, uh, we ended up finding about 1.9 million people that met the criteria of high risk. And Jim's going to talk a little bit about what is the criteria of high risk. But about 37% of the population uh, for us. So that's uh, the first project. The second project is one that we're just embarking on now. We've actually partnered with a group here in Wisconsin called BSG Analytics. Uh, they do consulting on employer benefit plan design. They have uh, created uh, what I would call a financial risk simulator where the uh, simulator uses uh, aggregate data and then provides the opportunity for an organization to go ahead and try and model what the financial risk might be for their um, population uh, as it relates to COVID-19, but also a reduction in um, less necessary and elective surgery. So the purpose is really that each organization would be able to look at their own experience. Um, the business services group analytics is going to really offer this product to employers that they work with, and we will be offering the product to health plans, and we'll be using our data to provide the background for that but also we're looking at can we repurpose this simulator tool for provider organizations as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to talk just a little bit in more detail about these two projects. Jim? Thank you, Dana. Um, so we have a couple of slides here, uh, one for each. Uh, and then, uh, as Candace had said, time for questions. This first one, the COVID-19 high-risk member report that Dana had indicated started with a request from our state Medicaid agency. Um, a few things that we wanted to highlight. The, the first one might seem obvious, built and delivered with urgency. But one of the reasons we wanted to mention that is um, this was a little bit of a different kind of project for WIO, at least. Um, in recent uh, memory since we went live on our new platform last summer. Uh, and the, um, the, the second uh, item here, the patient identifiers that were necessary to facilitate the outreach was also something of a, of a new um, uh, experience or initiative on WIO's part. The patient identifying information, of course, like pretty much all APCDs we receive from our data contributors to allow for patient matching and EMPI processing. But, um, but our typical use case, or, or really nearly all of our use cases, are uh, analysis using de-identified data. This was um, a great uh, initiative 
to really make much more urgent and quick turnaround use of WIA's data um, to facilitate the outreach effort that Dana described. We used the uh, conditions identified um, by the Center for uh, Disease Control and, Con uh, and Prevention. We also added in there uh, anybody who with the age of 65 plus. So about 1,300 codes were used as well as the age condition to arrive at the 37% uh, of, of all WIO uh, patients um, uh, marker. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the selection of those codes, um, again, guided by the CDC, um, but I believe we cast a little bit of a wider net um, uh, in an effort to, you know, be comprehensive in the lists the outreach lists that were provided. We also wanted to make sure that the identifying information sent to the health plans, uh, as well as Medicaid, was um, uh, was based on their their most recent eligibility. Uh, again, like I think pretty much all APCDs, we do receive eligibility data from health plans. So we had that uh, information in store and were able to align the findings uh, from our scan with um, those eligibility markers. One thing um, not on the slide that I want to mention is um, certainly uh, one of the value adds that WIO was able to offer was the, uh, the cross health plan um, experience that we had to gather uh, indicators of uh, patient conditions. Obviously, each health plan and the state Medicaid program has their own data, uh, but of course, we were able to uh, see that as patients move across health plans or in and out of the Medicare pro Medicaid program. And finally, we delivered it securely. It was an Excel report, and it included the patient identifier and contact information as well as an indication of each at-risk at at identifier. So it was a pretty straightforward read and um, output for their outreach staff to use. Um, and that, um, uh, that Excel document uh, indicated whether um, a patient qualified as any one or potentially multiple conditions. For the financial risk simulator project, which we're, we're, we're nearly complete with and, and ready to go out with, but um, it allows a, a health plan to model what is scenarios to determine the financial impact of, of COVID-19. And our partners, BSG Analytics, um, created a, a great uh, foundational and well-supported um, document that uh, I'm sure you all know Excel, but allows you to sort of interact with it and enter some varying assumptions that uh, then produce uh, varying results um, based on your inputs. The, um, the assumptions and the underlying uh, factors that produce a financial, um, a financial cost or savings indicator um, are based on the latest research that is available from the CDC, uh, BSG uh, looked uh, globally as well to publications like The Lancet and uh, the World Health Organization, um, and also uh, looked at uh, Wisconsin's uh, state-specific information to arrive at solid, um, uh, I, I would say, boundaries for assumptions that a user of this Excel sheet um, can input to arrive at um, uh, the financial findings. So um, what WIO is planning to do with BSG's work is to go ahead and load uh, summary level data that we process from each of the health plans who contribute to us, uh, their enrollment utilization and cost uh, um, uh, data, and then uh, based on their own and actual experience, but leveraging the assumptions uh, and the interactivity that BSG built, um, a health plan user will be able to, again, uh, employ sort of what-if scenarios or um, various analyses uh, based on their own experience.
Those, I think, are our summary comments, but this would be uh, an opportunity for maybe Dana for you to pipe in with anything that I may have missed. Um, but we're certainly open for questions as well. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I, I think you did a really good job with the overview. One of the things I might add is that um, for the uh, high-risk member reports, if you are going to do something like identify, you know, people that are at high risk, the CDC gives you essentially what I'm going to call clinical buckets. It's not a very technical term, but basically something like heart disease would be a, would be a clinical bucket. And so we had to take those 10 areas, identify the actual kind of diagnoses. So under heart disease, it might be congestive heart failure. Um, we had to identify those that were the most common. At least that was our approach because we knew we couldn't be comprehensive. And then within each one of those, identify the, the codes that went along with them. So that process was actually a bit more complicated, to my knowledge, at least when we started this. There was no um, list of codes that somebody could use in order to identify people at high risk. I think the interesting thing for us will be to determine down the road, um, based on our COVID-19 population, those that are actually diagnosed with the disease, whether we actually had the right risk factors in that list of 10 plus age um, in order to be able to refine that a little bit should we need to do that moving forward. So I'll stop with that and see if there's any questions. Dana, this is Candace. Um, thank you for sharing that. That was um, really great context in the end in terms of the codes. And um, I can imagine it's a little bit of a moving target as things sort of change and move and shift. So um, I want to remind everyone who is on the phone that you, you want this to be an interactive session, so we encourage you to submit questions. If you submit questions in the questions box, um, we are able to read those questions as presenters and moderators. Uh, if you choose to use the group chat function, um, that function does allow all of the people on the call to see your questions, so you might use either one. But we'll be looking at both of those um, as, as questions appear. You can also, if you prefer to ask a question or submit a comment, you can press star one, and we will unmute your line and allow you to verbally express either your question or comment. So it looks like we do have some questions for you. I'm going to start with one. Um, in, related, in relation to when you're talking about the, the condition flags, can you talk a little bit about the time period in which you look back for those conditions? Sure. This is Dana. Um, when we moved to a new vendor, we were not able to bring our historical data over. So we reseeded our historical data starting with 2016. So we looked uh, back at the conditions that we could find within the database from 2016 to 2019. Great, thanks, that's really helpful. We have a question from Miller at Comagine. Um, how does the use of your aggregated data provide different financial modeling capabilities than what the individual payers are able to do with their own data? And I can read that again if you need me to. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I have, the end, uh, have your question. I think that they could do this with their own data I think the advantage of having us uh, partner with BSG Analytics is twofold. One, the BSG Analytics is well known in our state as being a pretty sophisticated uh, analytics company. And so they've actually built already a lot of the, um, you know, the, the models that need to go into this. So in part, it would just save you a lot of time. You wouldn't have to, um, you know, figure all of this out. They've been working on this for probably a, 
month or two in order to build it. Um, and secondly, I think because it really runs off of summary data, we can essentially also do that work on their behalf. So we can, we can identify and create the summary data that will be used to populate it. Um, but in the end, could they do it themselves? They certainly could. What I find right now is that they're pretty busy just trying to figure a lot of other things out. And so we felt that this would be a value add for our data contributors. Yes, and this is Jim. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just sort of uh, emphasize one thing that Dana said there is as a voluntary ACCD, uh, you know, we really are partners with our health plans in this and are always looking for opportunities really to provide service to them uh, as we can. Thank you. That was, that was a very thorough answer. I appreciate that. Um, I do have one more question. Um, and this, uh, the question is, do you have a sense of how much the deterred care would not be provided versus care that will never come back or versus that will never come back? Yeah, we don't have a sense of that at this point. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that all APCDs can really uh, use their data to be able to determine uh, how, you know, what care is coming back first and what is the impact of that on the services that providers have had in place. Will there be a change in case mix, for example? Will those that are more acutely ill come back first? But I think that at least in our state, some people are predicting that maybe some care will never come back. And what will the impact of that be? So we don't, we don't know that yet, but to me, that is the perfect uh, use case for APC data. Absolutely, and I, I imagine that will be something that you're watching for sure. I, I will note as well, this is Jim again, that the, um, the, the financial risk uh, calculator uh, project does include an element for deferred care. So um, uh, for those of you with health plan experience, um, you know, there is there's certainly a cost for increases in care provided due to the coronavirus. There's also a long-term cost potentially associated with deferred care. But there's, um, maybe shouldn't put it this way, but the potential for short-term, maybe not savings, but reduced health plan spending due to deferred care as well. Great, thanks for that. Um, well, I think we'll move on to our next speaker. Again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type those in the chat and we will make sure that get, we get to your questions. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker. We have Shulay Jarovich here with Mathematica, and she's going to share her experience in um, and the work that she's doing using data to inform contact tracing. Shulay? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I originally planned to have this presentation with Candice Miller, um, who is volunteering in Massachusetts with contact tracing, so I'll do my best to cover her slides. Um, and then if you have specific questions, you can either email Candice or me uh, for this topic. Um, as, as the pandemic is progressing across our cities and our states, as you know, um, the conversations are moving towards what will be the next stage. And there has been a very good report published by Center for Health Security uh, from Hopkins um, to set the stage of what would be happening in the next phase of pandemic management. As you all know, we started with the um, slowing the spread strategies by stay home orders, um, social or physical distancing, um, increasing testing and, and quarantines. And at the same time, we've been working on increasing healthcare capacity and many of you have been working on estimates of ICU availability, hospital beds, um, in addition to estimating the COVID case, case loads. Um, as the states are and the country are thinking about the next phase and how we can reopen our economy, new strategies are needed. And contact tracing has been in the um, 
forefront of these discussions with a lot of governors, a lot of states, and uh, with the policymakers. So we thought that we will give you some brief on contact tracing and, and sh kind of share some of the experiences uh, from Massachusetts who started this about two or three weeks ago. And if, if you are from Massachusetts, please raise your hand and, and share your experience. Um, that will be very, very helpful. Um, so this map, I found it very useful looking at the state level um, um, policies that were implemented at Stay at Home. And as you can imagine, a lot of the states, um, the orders are expiring. Um, so policy decisions need to be made whether you want to extend those um, policies or replace with something else. Um, in, in some states, um, the orders were more local rather than statewide, and, and you see that gradually uh, some of these um, policies have been uh, changed depending on the local circumstances. What is case uh, contact uh, tracing and case in investigation? So this is, if you have a public health background, this is a, a very um, standard tool that the public health officials use to detect the sources of infection and also control the spread of the infection um, starting from the case. Um, so the case investigations start with interviewing the positive identified case to understand um, where they've been uh, and, and which contacts they have had in the past uh, 14 days of the COVID-19. Um, these calls could be the first contact these people will have with the healthcare authorities after the lab test. Um, so there will be additional um, sensitivities around the interviews as, as you're talking with the individuals who might be at a very difficult uh, time in, in their lives. Um, from that, then um, the next stage in the interviews are contacting the people who are identified from case interviewing and then have follow-ups with these people to, um, to monitor whether they are developing symptoms or whether they have to quarantine themselves at their home or, or um, go to a healthcare provider. Um, and as many public health interventions, um, the process, you know, kind of straightforward, but it has to have a lot of supplement and really well thought out plan, uh, starting with a public uh, information campaign, um, as well as the um, uh, st strong data structures so that we can link this information with our own public and social services data and to be able to trace these individuals almost real time um, so that we do not call them more than once or we, we integrate their healthcare and social needs to the resources that are available in our systems. In addition, sometimes, as you can imagine, um, there will be populations that will be hard to reach. Um, so different strategies would need to be implemented um, to reach those people looking at the either um, hot spotting techniques or community uh, organizations, et cetera. Um, at the heart of these uh, contact and tracing efforts really lies the transparency and a rapid cycle thinking and decision making to, uh, to understand the data, see what it's showing, and then inform the public health community for the next stage in epidemic management. Given the COVID-19 scale, um, doing this on the phone with um, the cases that we are identifying is a huge, huge scale. Um, so on the left side of the slide, um, we provided some high level estimates of assumptions. Um, so in this case, if we were to project 1,000 cases per day, and then let's assume they had 10 contacts uh, per case, um, this amounts to about 620 staff per week to do this on a real time, uh, contacting them within 24 hours and then expecting an 80% response rate um, to achieve um, the control that is required to manage the pandemic. And on the right, what you'll see is a, um, a recent uh, piece from NPR, um, and this is looking at more on a per capita basis and estimating a 30 public health workers uh, per uh, 100,000 residents. And you'll see the map in the states is mostly uh, yellow, which is that we have deficiencies in, in our labor force. Um, some states have been uh, working with volunteers, um, and some states you may have heard 
talking about hiring an army of contact tracers uh, to manage the pandemic once we are lifting our uh, home health, stay home uh, restrictions. Um, so the Massachusetts, I wish um, Candice could be here, but she called in last minute um, uh, fire with the Massachusetts program. Um, but the Massachusetts um, vision is to have this data hub that you see in the middle that would co connect the tracing collaborative, which is a public-private partnership with the local boards of health, and have a real-time exchange on the findings and, and the individuals that are identified who needs uh, more social services, linkage with the uh, provider community, and other support that they may need. Um, and this is a graphic, and both of them are available in the uh, public website that Massachusetts put together. Uh, and here you'll see that the uh, interaction with the individuals uh, could be through phone or there could be some other methods that you could develop using online surveys or text messages. And some, um, some institutions are working on, as you know, mobile apps to be able to have the contacts um, identify themselves and, and start tracing uh, with each other. As the NATO members and those of us who are working with state data analytics, um, I thought it might be good to think about where we can help and, and how we can leverage the existing resources that we have at our departments. A um, couple issues that raised um, in the last couple weeks is data security and privacy. Um, and I think Jim mentioned this in the APCD world and in our analysis, we tend to work with non-confidential data, but we do have a lot of experience thinking about data security, governance, and privacy. Um, so we could explain or help the, the uh, effort in identifying the policies that could be adapted to um, contact tracing efforts in the states. You might be asked to create tools um, to help the uh, people on the ground um, to understand who they are reaching and what the profiles are. Uh, you might be asked to help linking administrative data. Um, so this could be uh, the APCD data with HIE data and some social um, services data to understand um, who these individuals are and how they can get additional services. Um, in addition, um, there might be need for monitoring the results on a rapid cycle to understand whether the pandemic is um, increasing or uh, going into places that you have to have more dedicated effort, um, such as nursing homes, long-term care services, um, or uh, certain geographies in your state. In terms of data, a um, couple things that came from the states that we have been talking um, is that to identify cases, uh, lab tests have been used widely um, across the states to identify the initial um, contact, um, and a lot of states are utilizing patient master index in the HIEs or in the APCD data sets. Um, and they're also using Medicaid eligibility files. Um, again, Jim mentioned how they work with the Medicaid, uh, looking at the uh, enrollment information to pull the contact information for the identified cases. In addition, um, since def this effort is going to be large scale, um, thinking about risk identifiers, uh, chronic condition flags, um, risk scores for hospitalization or ICU ventilators would also help um, to customize um, the case investigations in the first place to make sure the individuals are um, appropriately um, linked with the uh, resources that they would need um, in, in the future. For the case tra tracing, um, the most important information for them is the uh, location of these people. Um, it could be the phone uh, numbers or other information that you could pull from the interviews or other businesses. Um, and also uh, identifying the location and, and working on network analysis to understand whether um, the tracing efforts are focusing on uh, certain neighborhoods or certain uh, congregations would, would help in targeting the case tracing efforts uh, more actively. And finally, linking this data with the um, food support, housing, or, or medicine that they would need um, is in another data strategy that you could bring into an effective case tracing um, 
programs in your state. So that was all that we wanted to cover. Um, so if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Sheila. We do have a couple questions um, from Ernie Shippy. Shippy. Ernie, your questions are really great questions and very detailed. I wondered if you would be willing to unmute, or press star one to raise your hand if we can unmute you so you could ask your questions. While we're waiting for, um, well, we're waiting for that. We do have another question, Chile. Um, if we go back to, so I'll, I'll take us back here for reference. On the second bullet, is that contract or contact tracing? And I think contact tracing. Thank you, Oscar. It is. It is contact. So what is it? Is that you identify a case, and then you ask the case whether they have close contacts with the people and identify those people. So um, it's both aimed to identify the source of the infection that your case received, as well as reaching back to those people with the idea that they are potentially exposed to the same virus that your case currently has. Thank you, Shule. Um, um, well, you know, I might go ahead and just read Ernie's question. In Canada, they have a flu watchers program since 20, 20, 2005 where thousands of volunteers submit weekly data on whether they have fever, flu issues. It's a great early warning system. Does the U.S. have a similar program to your knowledge? Um, so I've been looking at this a little bit. That's a great question, and I'm not able to identify a national system to do this. Um, what CDC has in the U.S. is a, a syndromic surveillance system where um, when people show up in ED with certain flu symptoms, um, they monitor that as well as the lab results where um, there are indicators for um, the flu-like, um, you know, uh, test. Um, I haven't seen yet any program like you're describing in Canada um, that is more population-based survey for, um, for symptoms. I don't know if anybody on the call would have better knowledge than me. I'm certainly not the expert on this. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear if anybody else um, Feel free to type your question in the chat or uh, sorry, in the questions box, or we also have the chat feature as, as well. Um, we have a second question from Ernie. Um, in Hong Kong, since some of the trans transmission in facial oral, uh, some housing units have poor ventilation plumbing issues, created large epid epidemics, which would contract tra tracing be able to find these type of housing issues where a rundown housing project could be created, creating a localized outbreak? Another good question. You know, that's why it's important to have the analytics on top of the contact tracing, Ernie. At the end of the day, the transmission, um, kind of the way the, the disease is transmitted between people are changing, right? So what the questions that you are asking the cases in terms of who you have been in contact with in the last 14 days, you have to define what you mean by close contact. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the structural issues like you're referring to in terms of the poor ventilation, plumbing issues, you know, they are not going to identify those people that they had in contact if you define your um, contact as, you know, who you talk to, who you, you know, interacted with closely, right? But if you have the cases analytics on top of it and you are seeing a cluster of cases or contacts um, that then link to your case within a certain geography, um, I think that's the way that you will be able to identify some of those structural issues. And, and it, at that point, public health workers have local 
um, visits to go to the um, uh, the environment in a way and assess the environment to see what else could explain the transmission. Excellent questions and excellent answers. Thank you, Shalay. Very helpful. I think um, we'll move on to our next presenter. And um, again, just encourage you all to continue sharing your questions. Um, we're happy to answer those as well. So our next presenter is Nicole Helby. She is from the, um, the Florida Center for Health Information Transparency. And today she'll be talking about using healthcare data to prepare, monitor, and respond to COVID-19 in Florida. Nicole? Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks, everyone, and, and thanks for inviting me to do this. I realize I might be the last person between a lot of you and the end of your Friday. Um, and I do tend to talk a little bit fast, so if I get ahead of you, please um, make me slow down. So uh, just to kind of give you a, a broad overview of who we are as an agency and what our role is in the state of Florida, um, we are the chief health planning and policy entity for Florida, uh, as designated in statute. So we um, administer the healthcare licensure and certification regulation of over 42,500 um, individual providers of 36 different types. And, and when we say providers, think of these as um, companies or buildings, uh, hospitals, nursing homes, nurse registries, things of that nature. Uh, our sister agency, the Florida Department of Health, is responsible for the licensure of medical professionals doctors, nurses, um, emergency personnel, and, and that. So we, we have a very close partnership with them and share quite a bit of data with them, um, especially because we are the administrators of the Florida Medicaid program. Um, and of course, enrolled providers in Medicaid are those that we license, as well as those um, that are licensed through the Department of Health. And so uh, we have a, a long history of, of data sharing with our sister agency. We've got about anywhere between 3.7 and 3.8 million members um, on our roster for Medicaid at any given time over the month. And um, our last year's spending was just over $29 billion with a B um, in Medicaid services. So we're a big Medicaid program um, and a pretty big state. Very, very quickly um, in our division, this just kind of gives you an overview, um, really to set the perspective on what our role is in terms of um, emergency response and pandemic response. So not only are we responsible for the licensure and regulation, including enforcement of compliance with emergency planning requirements and things of that nature, um, we also have the field office survey teams that go out and do the on-site surveys and inspections of healthcare facilities as required, um, both as by CMS, because we are a CMS certifying agency, um, as well as by our state statute. And that includes hospitals, residential facilities, all different types of facilities, labs, um, we have a whole team of architects and engineers uh, that are responsible for reviewing the building plans um, and conducting health safety inspections at all of those facilities. Um, we also have a unit that does Medicaid program integrity, so that's looking at a lot of the claims data and uh, scanning and, and running analytics to look for possible cases of fraud and abuse in the Medicaid program. Um, we have a commercial Medicaid managed care provider network that looks at network adequacy and the usage of some of those managed care plans. And then there's us here in the Florida Center that really serves as the data hub uh, for most, if not all, of those activities. And I won't read all of these to you, but this just gives you a broad scope of the different types of data um, that come through the Florida Center. It's, it's the facility data. We are the administrators of our state. So we call it an all-pair claims database. It's really a many-pair claims database. Uh, it is uh, a state requirement in law here, but it pertains specifically to health plans that are under contract with the state of Florida, either through our state's Medicaid managed care program, which is about 14 plans, or um, our state's state employee group health insurance program. And there's a handful that are on there, and then any other legal um, affiliates for those plans, but it, it doesn't quite cover every plan. So. Uh, we also have healthcare data analytics of various types that run through. Uh, we do run a couple of our transparency websites, Florida Health Finder, and then in partnership with the Healthcare Corps Institute from uh, Washington, D.C. as our contracted vendor that helps us run the Florida Health Price Finder. And they really are the administrators of our all-payer claims database, and have been close partners with us on that since 2016. Uh, we also receive adverse incident reports. This is those never events that happen at healthcare facilities that we need to know about in order to help promote safety, uh, patient safety. 
uh, pharmacy pricing. We have another website, this Marshall Rx, that shows retail prices of the 300 most commonly prescribed medications um, at the pharmacy level, searchable at the city and county level, uh, so you can compare the retail prices across pharmacies in your city. We do administer the Florida Health Information Exchange, um, and that again is through a contract with a great partner called Audacious Inquiry, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about them in a moment. Um, and then we do some other work around e prescribing and telehealth as well. So a lot going on. Um, we have a very robust team, and they're a great team to work with. Um, so uh, this is just you know kind of categorizing the different types of data that come through, and I'm only going to focus on a couple of these, so I won't read all these to you. But you kind of get the idea of the difference um, in the periodicity of the data that we receive. Um, and you know what what's kind of in there and what we would be looking at. So early on, I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly actually. Early on in the pandemic, you know, one of the things we first needed to look at was risk. And so you know, we're population we're the third most populous state in the nation at 21.4 million. Um, we have a very high senior citizen population. More than 20% of our residents are over the age of 65, and that doesn't necessarily include our seasonal residents who are often here in the winter months and into early spring, including January, February, um, that have part-time homes here from northern states. And so oftentimes they're not counted in our residential numbers. Um, many were still here at the beginning of the pandemic, and we did also see many return to Florida um, as the pandemic started to very seriously impact some of the home states up in the northeast. Um, and you can't blame folks for wanting to, to try to get away from that. Uh, we've got about 13.1 million residents registered to have at least one chronic disease. That's data from our um, state health department. And 5.6 or so with two or more chronic diseases, which we know places those individuals at potentially increased risk for COVID. So we were very, very early on looking at, um, you know, not only our hospitals, but we have almost 700 nursing homes and more than 3,000 assisted living facilities licensed in our state. And then that doesn't include the number of agencies that uh, provide home and community-based services to vulnerable patients in their homes that have the potential to be going in and out of those uh, homes and, and potentially asymptomatic carrying virus in. Um, so immediately we needed to begin tracking um, the status and the activity with those different facilities. Let's skip ahead. At the same time, this is information that was put out by our Florida Department of Health. This is updated twice daily. Um, these are not our numbers today, by the way. These are our numbers. I think this was like Wednesday or so. Um, but this is open to the public. Uh, it's with the code tracking. Each of these modules pops out into some more detailed data about what you're looking at. I just kind of give you a snapshot of the case counts, um, the trend over you know new cases over the days, the age distribution, and then the testing situation as it was a couple of days ago. Um, so really good public information, and of course this is our key resource for monitoring um, you know the movement of the epidemic throughout Florida. Most of you probably know Florida is not new um, to having to deal with and plan for emergencies. And we learned several lessons um, after some of the more recent hurricanes that impacted our state. Um, Hurricane Hermine that wasn't big, but it, it did uh, cause a lot of trouble in the Panhandle area that hadn't been impacted with direct hurricane in quite some time. And uh, even more so by Hurricane Irma, um, just because of the massive impact that it had throughout our state. And we had a tracking system in place at that time um, jointly with the Department of Health but what we learned was that we needed something a little bit more agile, um, a little bit more configurable for specific types of emergencies. There was information that could not be captured in that system that was deemed needed. Um, and so over the next couple of years, we set about um, custom building a system for Florida's needs that is configurable. Um, we had a, a great uh, partnership to, to do the internal build on that. It launched in 2018, the first time it was utilized was in Hurricane Michael and um, performed exceptionally well. It was brand new at that time. Um, we made sure that it was internet-based, web-based, and it is also mobile-enabled. One of the things that we learned after Hurricane um, Irma specifically, power was out, phone lines were out, but oftentimes people could communicate with us via text or they could find internet service in some areas and get online with their cell phones. We require daily reporting and sometimes multiple times a day into this system. And it's absolutely essential 
that the healthcare facilities are keeping in close contact with us to let us know how they're doing, let us know what their needs are, so that we can work with emergency management at the state and at the county level to deal with those needs and help them address those needs. And so it was critical that this be accessible to them. Um, and it worked really, really well during Michael um, with that web enabled and that mobile enabled. A lot of people were able to dial in on their cell phones. Um, for those that were able to get in through their computers, it utilizes our agency single sign-on. So if they do other business with our agency, their licensure or anything else, um, it gave them very easy access into the system without having to maintain an, another whole set of login. Um, and again, you know, based on our experiences in the past, it was very well designed for the type of reporting that we would need out of it. And so this is just a couple of daily, uh, a couple of samples of some of the things that we're looking at on a daily basis. Um, you get a little snapshot there of what the entry screen looks like for a facility. We're able to track um, bed availability down to uh, the day. Actually, the hospitals during the first portion of the pandemic were updating twice daily at 10 a.m. and at 6 p.m. Each day we would pull out. Um, we've let them back that down to once daily at this time by 10 a.m. Um, but so every day we're pulling reports with our state surgeon general and the secretary of agency. They're sitting there directly with us at the state emergency operations centers, and we're looking at the status of these facilities. How many beds do they have? How many ICU beds do they have? How many new patients have they admitted? How many are positive? How many ventilators do they have? We've got it mapped out. We're also looking at the same as required from our nursing homes and our assisted living facilities, understanding where they are. And keeping in mind that assisted living facilities in our state are not required to provide in-house medical services or have in-house nurses. Uh, in many cases, they are um, they have residents who are very independent and um, are able and, and often utilize their free will to come and go from the ALS, you know, as they desire. And so it was very much a concern for us about some of those vulnerable patients, you know, being out in the community and then returning to their ALS and potentially exposing others. And so we were very proactive at the beginning at putting messaging out to them about screening criteria and the use of PPE and and uh, ensuring that everyone had adequate supplies of PPE in those facilities. Um, and we also have them reporting into the system daily, what is your, your days on hand of your N95 masks, of your gowns, of your eye shields and eye covers. Um, and so we can keep track if there's any needs. The county emergency operations centers were designated as the distribution points for any state supplies that are distributed out. And so then we put them in contact with their county EOC and they can retrieve or have the supplies delivered from there. So it's been super helpful um, in our partnership with those organizations. What has also been incredibly helpful is, um, especially early on, um, there certainly was a large amount of concern in the community. We were watching uh, news reports of very bad situations happening in other countries and, and uh, unfortunately even in other states. I, I know New York has had just um, such a, a hard time and, and our hearts go out to what's still happening up there right now. Um, so we wanted to try to put some community um, irk at ease as early as possible. So the first thing that we put out was we started publishing the bed availability numbers by county. And so you could go on to our public website and you could look at your county and you could say, gosh, okay, it's not bad. They're, they've still got 30% of their beds are available. You know, their ICU is not even half full or whatever it was. And what this also does, um, as many of you know, when you start to put things out publicly, um, the facilities start self-policing themselves very, very well in terms of making sure the data is accurate and correct. And this caught the attention of a lot of the hospital and nursing home leadership. And, uh, you know, they were on it, making sure that the numbers were updated regularly and making sure that the information was correct. And so that helped us with data quality in the back end since, you know, we do rely on them to self-report this information. Um, it wasn't until a little bit later, um, but more recently we also did start publishing the names of the residential facilities, uh, nursing homes and ALS, uh, that had COVID positive cases. Um, the facilities all along have been strongly encouraged if they had a positive case in the facility to obviously notify the families and then notify the families of other residents of precautions that they're taking to ease any concerns. But as you can imagine, if you're a daughter or a son or a, you know, a sibling of a person who's in one of these facilities and you're not hearing anything, do they have it, do they not have it, you start to become very, very worried. And so again, you know, in the interest of easing some of that public concern, 
we, um, in partnership with the Department of Health, they published the names of the facilities so that the community and family could be aware if, if they needed to check on their loved ones. Uh, our discharge data, I, I do want to give a great prop to the longstanding history of discharge data we have. And where we noticed that this was very, very helpful was in working with the uh, Florida Department of Emergency Management, the Florida Department of Health, and our Florida National Guard as they started feeding data into all different kinds of models. This one here is a snapshot of the um, IHME model. That's the Institute for Health Metrics and Education out of the University of Washington. Um, this is one that I, I think a lot of uh, news outlets and I, I think a lot of other states have been utilizing, uh, one of the more heavily utilized ones. Um, we also ran through them with several others, you know, just understanding it. And where it helped was understanding the migration of patients across county lines. Um, we have a one particular county that's a very small county, and 96% of the people who are admitted into a hospital are not admitted into the hospital in that county. They go to a neighboring county. And so we needed to understand what that utilization pattern looks like across the state, also their capacity trends, you know, how long are beds typically occupied, um, you know, and then again, as someone mentioned earlier, looking at claims data, also looking at prevalence of risk factors in the community, hospitalizations related to diabetes and respiratory diseases and things of that nature. I'm going to skip ahead. I, I realize I'm talking really fast. This is a really key thing that I, I wanted to mention, and it's still developing. Um, I mentioned earlier our partner, Audacious Inquiries. Uh, they have been extremely innovative, and they're, they're such great partners. You know, we sit down and we brainstorm with them and say, you know, can, do we think we can do this? And uh, they're very good at finding yeses, and I know that they work with a number of other states. We have in our state something called the Event Notification Service. This is a live stream of admit discharge transfer messages, ADP messages on a hospital system. Typically what we do with this is we match it up against an internal MPI, and then health plans and primary care providers predominantly can subscribe, and they can receive real-time alerts if one of their members or patients is hospitalized or discharged from a hospital. We have recent laws enacted in Florida that require 24-hour notification of admissions and discharges to PCPs, and this actually automates that um, for them if they choose to subscribe to it. Normally, once that match is made and that alert is sent over to the subscriber, we do not keep those. They're purged every 72 hours. Um, it's not like there's a big giant repository of those stored. But during an appropriate nationally or state declared emergency, we do temporarily put a stopper in the drain and we start to retain those ADT messages um, for several purposes. The one I want to allude to today that's very specific and still evolving, um, simply by knowing when a patient is admitted and discharged, and we also receive the majority of the time the affiliated diagnoses with those visits, um, AI is helping us calculate some estimations for an average length of stay related to COVID-19 at the facility level and at the county level, also across um, the CDC designated age bands. And so this is still a work in progress. I wanted to be able to show you some numbers, uh, but we're still tweaking the algorithms and that uh, we're not quite ready to put those out for prime time yet. Uh, but the Surgeon General here in Florida has been very, very interested in this, uh, as well as the planners, because it, it's helping us understand that if someone is admitted into the hospital for a COVID um, illness, how long is it before that bed can be available for another person? Because as we know, this pandemic is, is probably going to be with us for several more months at least. Um, so that's something a little bit unique and innovative that we have going on. I think, yes, that was my last slide. Um, I apologize for the rapid fire, but again, excited for the opportunity to share this. And, um, you know, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Nicole, thank you so much. Um, just looking at the time, I think um, we're not going to have time for question and answer, but I do see that a couple questions came in, and I will make sure that those questions get forwarded on to Nicole so that you can get answers for that. Um, just a couple wrap up before we end for the day. Uh, see, there we go. Um, you know, as, as Lauren mentioned at the beginning, this is meant to be a series of um, learning sessions. Some topics that have risen to the top for us uh, in previous sessions have been perhaps talking about telehealth data, lab data, um, as Shuva mentioned, some of the timeliness and, uh, and the security of data. If there are other topics, um, if, you, if you like any of these topics, we would encourage you to you know, put a note into the question field or into the chat box um, or email us after this call. Uh, we'll have uh, contact information at the end. Um, if there are other topics that you want to hear about, that's great. 
Um, and then, Shulay, I'll let you close out with just a final resource that we wanted to highlight for you as well. Shulay? If you had called in in our earlier webinars, Norm and I worked on, and our team worked on creating a list of resources. Um, so from that, we also created now what we call Data Premier um, that has the codes that were shared across all the presentations in terms of the COVID-19 codes, lab test codes, et cetera. And as Dana was presenting, I checked the high risk chronic conditions are in that document as well. Um, so if you click on this list, then you'll get a hopefully a useful um, couple pages document where you can find information that you need. And we are still updating that website for the other dashboards and data related to COVID and policies on, on the website that Norm shared with you. Thank you, Shule. Uh, we will have this presentation available for you, the recorded session, um, from both the NADO website and from us. We will make sure that you have the information that you need. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to any one of us on this contact page. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great weekend, everyone.